I'm Eric Glass, and you're listening to a This American Life Christmas Spectacular. We have sounded the alarm asking our contributors for brand new Christmas stories because they and they alone can save Christmas. This next one, about a savior come to earth, living as a human, is about the difficulty of being a savior or a prophet or anything like that amongst us humans. Here's some Heather O'Neill. Jesus and I were pretty good friends. And after he disappeared from our neighborhood and all those TV reporters started showing up on our street, I was a pretty hot property. My mom would freak out and call them vultures when they tried to ask me questions, but I'd try and chill her out. Be cool, I'd say. And it wasn't just that I liked being on TV. I truly liked talking about Jesus. I still do, and to this day, people are always asking me to tell them everything I know about him. Jesus and I were in grade 6 when we first met, and back then, not everyone was allowed to hang out with me. A part of the reason was the way I dressed. I was the only girl in class who had a pair of high heels, and for my birthday, my mother bought me a ton of black bracelets with studs on them. Other people's parents said I looked like a whore, and they didn't want their kids to get my whore cooties or something. But my attitude has always been just to be who you got to be. A part of this way of thinking comes from me, but a good part of it also comes from the stuff that Jesus taught me. But more on that later. Jesus first showed up in the middle of the school year and sat in the back of the class. On that first day, when our chemistry teacher put on this movie about molecules, Jesus held up his hands in front of the projector and made a shadow puppet of a dove. That's how I first noticed him. It was about a week later when everybody started to notice Jesus. In moral ed, we had to give a presentation on a social concern, and Jesus did his on world hunger. He went up to the front of the classroom without a loose leaf paper or anything, and started going on about how there wasn't such a thing as world hunger, which as well as being a downright weird thing to say, was also factually incorrect. We had all seen pictures of Ethiopia on the news, and those poor kids were definitely hungry. Jesus said that if God fed the sparrows and butterflies, then he would also feed humans. The teacher pointed out that a lot of animals had gone extinct because the environment hadn't provided for them. But Jesus shrugged and went back to his seat, so we just figured he was really stupid. Since Jesus and I lived on the same block, we'd walk home from school together. One day, on our way home, he invited me over to his house to play with his Ouija board. As we walked to his house, Jesus told me that his father didn't really love his mother. He didn't believe that Jesus was his child. He told me that while swinging his lunch pail. He told me that the same way you'd tell someone that you liked apples. When someone tells you something like that all casual, It sort of takes the pressure off. You don't have to start rocking them in your arms and stuff. I appreciated Jesus for going easy on me like that, since we've all got our own troubles. His family lived in a building that had a huge billboard advertising beer on the roof, and there were dogs walking around in the stairwell like they owned the joint. We went into his room, closed off all the lights, and set up the Ouija board As soon as we touched the marker, it started zipping around like a cockroach high on roach poison. I'd never seen such a thing before. Jesus and I took our fingers off the marker, but it kept sliding around just the same. It spelled out, I am with you, Jesus. Jesus and I screamed our heads off. We jumped off the couch and ran right into the apartment hallway. Under the stairwell, I let Jesus put his hand against my t-shirt to see how hard my heart was beating. Jesus continued to get into trouble for ridiculous things at school, like photocopying his head in a copier in the school library and giving himself a haircut in art class. 
He wore his ski mask one day, even though it was April already, and impersonated Gollum's voice underneath it. I told my mom about it, and she said he might be schizophrenic. But she changed her mind about him when she met him. One really warm spring day, Jesus showed up at my apartment. I never invited people over, so I was a little put off having Jesus in our house. Once I had Georgie over, and he said he found our apartment depressing. I like your place, Jesus said, leaning against my bedroom window pane. You have a great view from here, right out onto the record store. It probably helps you dream of music. We have the best neighborhood. Wouldn't you rather we lived in Westmount, I asked. Westmount was the fanciest neighborhood in the city, and my mother was always going on about how if she won the lucky seven, she'd set fire to the building and move us there in a smoke cloud of glory. Being rich is stupid, he said. It's way better to have less. It makes you cooler. No one from a rich background can ever really be cool. He said all of this just the way he dropped the news about his dad. Very matter of fact. Maybe that was why I bought it. It seemed to just make sense, like he was saying something that I had already thought of myself, but had never actually gotten around to putting into complete sentences. Jesus' words made me feel like no matter how much there was something deep down wrong with you, there really wasn't anything wrong with you at all. Jesus liked absolutely everybody in our school, in a way that I'd never seen before or since. I learned this one day at lunchtime. It was sunny and beautiful out, so we went to sit on the picnic tables that were at the end of the schoolyard. Ah, uh, we'd better turn right back, I said. Look who's at the table. It was Sam, a boy no one talked to. He lived across the street from the school, so his mother assumed she didn't have to get dressed when she came over. She'd show up with his lunch in her house coat and slippers. His dad had a beard that came down to his chest, and he walked down the street looking straight ahead of him, never using his neck. And once at the grocery store, I'd see him using a sock as a wallet. I think he's all right, Jesus said. He reminds me of Willy Wonka. I saw him trying to burn the bottom of his shoes with a lighter, I said. There was no stopping Jesus, so we walked over towards him. Sam looked at us both, expecting us to tell him to get lost. Can we sit with you? Jesus asked, sitting down. Okay, Sam said wearily. Do you like the white stripes? I asked to make conversation. When they're in the middle of the street, I guess I do, he said nervously, not knowing what the hell I was getting at, as though this was a setup to a joke that would end with me brushing liquid paper across his face. I spent the lunch looking at my feet, not really knowing what one should say to the insane. Jesus just smiled, peacefully chewing his peanut butter sandwich. Did you ever go to a fair last year, Sam said suddenly. They have these fancy horses with hair that goes down to their feet. He took a photograph out of his pocket of the skinniest, prettiest white horse I'd ever seen. It was more beautiful than a unicorn. What could I say? The world was filled with mysteries. Then our teacher, Mrs. Dumont, went on maternity leave, and we got stuck with Mrs. Allison. On the first day, she told the class that this boy, Quincy, hadn't paid his lunch fees yet. She said the only way you could be excused from lunch fees was if your father didn't work. She asked if this was the case, and Quincy just shifted in his seat. She told him to bring in a note the next day from his dad, explaining that he didn't have a job. Every day for the rest of the week, she would ask Quincy where the note was. Another thing Mrs. Allison had a problem with was the way Jesus fluttered from desk to desk helping the weaker kids with their long division. Mrs. Dumont used to look the other way with this, but Mrs. Allison said that, 
As well as being disruptive, it wasn't giving her an accurate sense of who the class knuckleheads were. Where's your lunch? asked Jesus. I was sitting in the cafeteria with my head down on the table. Mrs. Allison, I said. She tossed it. I explained how she saw me eating a mock chicken sandwich and how she held it up for everyone to see. I explained how she picked it up with the tips of her fingers like it was a dirty sweat sock and said she was going to send me home with one of those nutrition wheels to give my mother so she could know better. Jesus stormed off. I followed him down the hallway. He kicked open the door to the teacher's lounge and walked right in. A terrible whiff of stale cigarette smoke hit me. It was the first time that anyone had ever stood up for me. It was terrifying and wonderful at the same time. It made me feel like I'd found a hundred dollar bill and was being chased by a rabid dog all at once. All the kids in the hall got hysterical when they saw that Jesus had just walked into the teacher's lounge. It was magically off limits. They all started banging on their lockers and calling out for joy like the power had just gone off. But this was even better than that. It was as if the whole building was coming down. There were all kinds of stories about what Jesus had said to Mrs. Allison in the teacher's lounge that day. In my mind, I imagined her crumpling to her knees as he made her realize everything bad she'd ever done to me. Jesus was suspended from school for a week. In class, Mrs. Allison said Jesus wasn't the big shot we all thought. The principal agreed with her that he was a troublemaker and that he was messing with everyone's heads. His father wouldn't let him stay at home alone during the day. He said he didn't want Jesus messing up the house. So Jesus rode the bus back and forth and hung around downtown. I heard how he hung out in the pool hall, and the older teenagers would hoist him onto the table and he would just talk. They said he was funnier than Robin Williams. But if I knew Jesus, he was just telling it like it was. Then on the third day of his suspension, Jesus never came home. The story went that he was abducted, but nobody could really say for sure. The thing is, he would have been really easy to kidnap. Jesus trusted everyone. There are pictures of Jesus plastered to every telephone pole in the city, and practically the whole school had to be treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. Sam said he saw Jesus in the park a little while after he vanished, picking up litter. But you couldn't believe what Sam said. He'd become totally obsessed with Jesus after the disappearance. Every composition he wrote in class was about him. The teacher said it was just his way of coping with the stress. I guess I was dealing with some serious stress of my own because one day in art class when the teacher told me that little girls who wore black tank tops didn't get into college, I looked right back at him and said, What makes you so perfect? You've done too many lousy things yourself to be judging children. And the teacher got all red in the face because he knew it was the truth. Stick to your teaching from now on, said someone from the back of the class. And we all nodded and muttered our consent. I knew that Jesus would have loved that. These were the kinds of things that he would say, and it felt good to say them. Heather O'Neill is the author most recently of the book Lullabies for Little Criminals.